told John Cameron Swayze, he said, take, take the licking and keep on kicking. <laughs> you remember them? Wasn't yeah. it full of them? Yeah. Uh, no, it was Timex. Timex, wasn't it? And that's true, because I still wear Timex. That's right. Man, uh, I lost it on anything else. What did he say? Where's his arm? His daddy bought him a gold expensive watch one time and wouldn't run. Yeah. Mother Jim, if you need to ever find some life, yeah. I have a sister Linda, she's been jumping ditches on you. I've heard it's of pretty it. fun from what I understand, too. The land. Yeah, <laughs> the land is real hard, but, but it cost me two hundred and twenty five dollars for a tire, so <laughs> goodness, my goodness. Did they have to the wreck have to pull you out? Yeah. How much did that cost? Sixty. That's not too bad. Well, I wasn't far from from the place. Yeah. But uh Freddie, that's the guy that does my car kind of he he said, I'm not charging you anything that you do have to pay for the rest. And, uh, but he checked it out. He said, he said you skin it. It's skin under there. He went under it. He said, you skin it. It's good, but you didn't break anything that I could tell. That's, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Right? Yeah, you start breaking stuff under yeah. undercarriage, you can really run some money. Big money. Yes, sir. But I broke that tire. <laughs> he, the guy at the tire store there, and he said, uh, let me have it. He said, I think I, I might can fix it. He come back out and he said, There's no, no hope. There's no fixing that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. You do it, you do it all right. <laughs> well, I got out of here. I want to read something. Yeah. Did, did, it, did it run the rim? No, it didn't run the rim. Oh, that's good. When I, when I hit it, it busted the tire. I heard the tire when it busted. Yeah. It busted the tire, but it jumped with me over that thing. That thing was about this wide, so the whole car was sitting up on that. It just leaked over. It leaked over. Yeah. And then it sat down. Well, the tire on the side I was on was about this high off the ground. And that thing's about six inches tall. I had a tough time getting in and out of the car. So I had to drop down to the. Because the high foot. <laughs> I don't know how many people stopped and asked me if I was all right. But there I sat. So I'm waiting for the rest of You're going to get some attention one way or the other, aren't you? Oh, and my boys. Uh, I didn't call Chad. I just didn't want to call Chad. I couldn't handle it. Yeah. And uh, he came in last night. And I said, why didn't you call me? I said, well, I use it work. I called Clay and he was at work, so I just handled it myself. Yeah. I'm a big girl. Yeah. <laughs> you took care of it. The Lord and I handled it because I'm doing so great. <laughs> this one I had to pull something up on it, underneath it. Underneath it, the way that they built stuff and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God, you're okay. Yeah, thank the Lord. Yeah. I was thanking him all afternoon. Yeah. And it happens just that quick. Yeah, yeah and just for nothing. Mm -hmm. I, and I knew that thing was there because I just, I don't know why I just started riding on it. Brother Jim, we ready when y'all are. Oh, amen. You ready? Amen. Since Jesus came in my heart. Line. And you're already going to be up there, so you'll probably be all right. I hope so. Well, good evening. Welcome. Good to see y'all here tonight. As we begin our service, let's turn to page 29. 29 as we stand. Since Jesus came into my heart. 29. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul For which long I had so Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart the 
floods of joy my soul the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus into my heart and my sins which were many all washed away since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy hold my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart on the last I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy As onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy, oh my soul Like the sea billows Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Jimmy. You may be seated. Thank you for being here this Wednesday night. Appreciate you coming out to the house of the Lord. And appreciate God bless us with a good day. Beautiful day out there. Nice, warm, spring-like day. Then tomorrow, probably about 30 degrees. But, no, actually, I don't know what. I think within a week or so, it's supposed to, the temperature is supposed to drop back down a little bit, but not too too bad from what, I'm, what I can tell. But uh, Lord bless us with a good day. Everything's blooming out there. Uh, all the all the Bradford pears and regular pears and blueberry bushes and all that's blooming out. So I thank the Lord for the good warm day we've had today. And thank you for being here tonight. We're going to open up a word of prayer. Ask God to bless us and help us. Now, continue to pray for Brother John. He's still, he's not here tonight, of course, you see, and he's still uh, trying to get over his sickness, his bronchitis. Let's pray for him. The Lord might touch him and help him. Remember Brother Reuben with the sore on his foot that has not healed and is getting worse. So they've got him right now, as far as I know, up until, uh, well, actually, I think it was through Tuesday, which it was yesterday, he was supposed to get another word from them, what, whether he could walk again or not. But uh, they had him off his foot there for a while, not doing his regular walking that he normally does all the time to keep his diabetes in check. But uh, you pray for Brother Reuben, the Lord might continue to help him. Continue praying for Haley and and. Uh, for Sarah, Lord might help them. They're still not feeling feeling well. None of the children are feeling feeling real well right now. And uh, the last couple of days, Sister Amber just kept them inside because even though it's been beautiful, they've just been sick. So let's pray for them. Lord might touch them, help them. And then others been sick in our midst. We've got a lot of folks just been sick, not feeling well. Remember Miss Patty? She's got some real serious health needs. She's trying to find out from the doctors what they want to do about that. Uh, remember Jay Weatherill, preacher friend of mine out in Arizona. He's got uh, colon cancer. They diagnosed him with colon cancer. Cancer, and they're not sure what remedy they're going to try to take with that. He's, he's 81 to, uh, years old now, and uh, so they're not sure exactly what route they want to take or what stage. They haven't told them what stage cancer it is yet. So you pray for them. The Lord might give them wisdom and direction there. The Lord might help them but uh, uh, to make the right decisions, what needs to be done. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's open up a word of prayer. I ask God to bless us and help us. Lord willing, we'll be back in our study tonight in the chronology of the end time. And uh, we'll be back in chapter number eight, book of Revelation. So uh, I'm going to try to get us out in a decent time tonight. We're, we're going to go up to a certain point, not go beyond that, because we're getting into the actual sounding of the, uh, the first trumpet. And so it's going to be a little bit lengthy. So uh, well, I doubt if we'll get into it tonight, but we'll try to get up to that point. Let's ask God to bless us and help us tonight in this service. Brother Randy, if you would, would you open us up a word of prayer, please? Yes, Lord, thank you, God. Yes, Lord. Please, God, do that. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. Help him, God, please. 
Touch him, Lord, please, God. Please, Lord. Please, God. Lord, we need revival. Yes. Yes, God. Help us, Lord, please. Please, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 All right, Brother Jim, come lead us in the next song. All right, let's take our hymnals now and flip over to page 127. Page 127 as we stand. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son Who yielded his life and atonement for sin And opened the life gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. Divilest defender who truly believed that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport. When Jesus we see, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. That's good. That's a good thing. All right, let's spend the next few minutes now uh, fellowshipping, welcoming each other.
Amen. Thank the Lord for a good time of fellowship. Thank you, Sister Linda, for the good music tonight, the good playing. Thank you, Brother Jim, for good song selection. Y'all pray for Sister Linda now. She's been trying to jump ditches in her car again. Sister Minnie, she had a little, I call it a fender bender, but I don't know if that's what you'd call it. it depends on, she tore up a tire and uh, just had a little accident. Misjudged the road there as it curved, curved around. And so I told my wife, now I don't know, I hadn't talked to Sister Linda yet, but what I tell you, when we received word, I said, her boy's going to have a fit when they find out about that. They're going to be telling her, we ain't letting you drive no more. <laughs> but I just, I just know where sons are. Sons are going to say, Mama, you ain't driving anymore. But it never works out that way. But, but y'all pray for her that the Lord might help her. I, she doesn't seem to be physically harmed, but you never know. It takes a couple of days sometimes on that kind of thing. So she might get a little achy and sore, but I hope she doesn't. But you pray for her and then pray for Sister um, Linda Gilliland, the Lord might touch and help her. She's had her dialysis day and didn't go real well. You pray the Lord might help her and be with her. Sister Vickery's at home with her mother. Uh, they're just having to kind of do their own home health care kind of right now. But uh, they let her mom come home from the hospital. But didn't really have anybody to take care of her. And she's just really hands-on right now. So you pray the Lord might touch her mother and help her and uh, encourage Sister Linda. I know that's discouraging for her. Uh, not not taking care of her mother, but just not being able to be at the house. You can't be two places at one time. You just can't. And uh, after a while, it can be a bit discouraging. So you pray, Lord, and be encouragement to her and help her. Um, and then, Sister, uh, all of our Lindas, all of our Lindas need prayer uh, this week. So, Sister Merck, she's trying to help take care of Brother Reuben. I did not get a report today, so I thought that she had said Tuesday. Did I, was it yesterday? Do you know, Sister Linda, if it was yesterday? I thought she told me on Sunday he has to be off of it till this Tuesday, which would have been yesterday. The doctors at the VA said, don't, don't put any weight on it, don't, don't be walking around. Stay off of it as much as you can. You know, he walks all, Brother Reuben walks all the time, trying to keep his diabetes in order. And, uh, but he's got that sore in the bottom of his foot. It's been there a long, long time. It just won't heal up with that diabetes. But you, you pray for Brother Reuben, the Lord might help him, Brother Charlie. Uh, others that um, physically been out of our church. I mentioned in, in prayer before uh, Sister uh, Carol had gotten here tonight, both Haley and Sarah are still sick. They've been sick for several days now. And uh, Sister Amber has been sending out pictures. They've just been beautiful outside, but she hasn't been able to take them outside. They just kind of camped out there in the living room on little pallets on the floor. They've just been sick, not, not doing well. So you pray the Lord might touch them and help them. And uh, the Lord might, uh, Lord might touch him and help him to, to get back to normal pretty soon. And then Brother John, as you've noticed, he's not here tonight. He never misses unless he's really sick. He's still got that real bad bronchitis. So I've got to call him when I leave here tonight. I meant to try to do it before I got in today, but I had forgotten it slipped my mind. You pray for Brother John, the Lord might help him. Um, also, remember our, uh, our discipleship by design class as far as announcements. Uh, remember that coming up on March the 7th. That's next Tuesday. So keep that in mind. Next Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Right here in the fellowship hall at 7 o'clock, we'll be having our second discipleship by design class. I plan on having some several materials for you that we'll, we'll pass out to everybody that's there and uh, help you in, in your uh, soul winning and witnessing efforts. Um, so, so be here next Tuesday if you possibly can. We'll do it just like we did the last time. We'll come in first. We'll have the refreshments, Lord willing, have refreshments set up. And when you come in, just take your plate and get you a drink, sit down, and then I'll have a time in the Word. And then I'll always, I plan on having a time in the Word first and give you some encouragement out of the Word, some edifying factor out of the Word pertaining to soul winning or witnessing. And then we'll go more practical uh, lessons and instructions and try to uh, talk with you about that. Uh, but we'll, this will be a busy meeting this coming Tuesday, so you pray, Lord, give us wisdom, help us be able to get it, everything in within that hour. My goal is to keep everything within that hour. Um, if you stay over for an extra hour or whatever, but, you know, after that fellowship and that's, that's on you, <laughs> we plan to be finished so that you can go home if you want to within the hour. So, uh, uh, Lord willing, we'll try to do that. Now, one, one change in schedule for April's meeting. Um, I did look at it, but I'm taking Brother Ken Witt's word for this. But uh, the, the second Tuesday is April 11th. We're going to move just for April, just for the month of April. We're going to move it from the first Tuesday night, which is on the 4th, to the second Tuesday night, April the 11th. Uh, the reason being, I'm going to have Brother Ken Witt come in and talk with us. After I give the study, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Witt, and he's going to give us some practical lessons. I just want you to hear it from another voice, an, another church, another pastor, another voice, saying the same thing but having different experiences than what I've had. I can show you the experiences I've got and give you those, those stories and all that, but he's got different ones. 
And he's got a lot around this area because I've only been over here just three and a half years or so. Brother Ken's been over here his whole life. And, of course, he pastors Bible Baptist Church right here in Anderson. And they, they have a very active soul winning uh, and visitation program in the church, church-wide. They go out every Saturday. They either go out door knocking uh, and then every other Saturday, they, they, they've got a, a witnessing uh, street preaching and holding up signs and passing out tracts uh, down at the jockey lot outside. And uh, so very active in their witnessing soul winning effort. So he's going to come. That'll be in April now. He'll come. It'll be on the 11th instead of the 4th. Same time, same, same everything else. Just I'm going to turn the practical side over to him for that 25 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. And he'll share with us some examples and some stories and some pointers maybe uh, how to handle some of these things. So. Um, he'll be our guest for, for the 11th. So that'll be the only change. We'll go right back in, maybe go back to our first Tuesday again. This should just be the one change. Remember Saturday, remember Saturday March 25th now, the end of this month from 1230 to 2.30, uh, be the baby shower for Sister Christine and Brother Joe. So you ladies, if you can, please plan on that. And uh, if you possibly can, please come to that and support that. Uh, Missionary of the Week, Brother Bob and Sister Marie Ford. Let's continue to pray for them. Lord might bless them and help them. And I've got one... Um, Actually, it's just a separate card. It's not really a prayer letter tonight from Brother Comer, Brother Richard Comer, and I want to read it to you. Um, it says, Dear Pastor and friends, we want to say how grateful we are for your um, years of faithful prayers and giving to our ministry. It has been our joy to co-labor with you. Thank you for uh, also for the love gift sent. Please pray for um, uh, Rick as he plans to leave uh, the middle of next month for Mexico. He will drive round trip for several thousand miles, pray for souls to be saved, and for believers and pastors to be encouraged. Also pray for his safety. I had uh, one other letter or, or else he'd sent something else I had read where I'd heard about that. It's going to be a long trip for him, uh, a long round trip. Uh, it is hard to believe, but uh, uh, Rick turns um, 80, R Richard turns 80 this year. God is good. God bless each of you, uh, Rich and Patty Comer. So I want to pray for them. Lord might continue to bless them. And he's recovering back. Uh, what was it? it was during COVID? He was attacked down in Georgia, um, uh, North Georgia, so with a hammer. Somebody had mental issues and attacked him. But he did. He did. I am correct on that, right, Brother Jim? That was Brother Comer, and uh, he's he's doing well from that. But uh, at one time, it, it was really kind of touch and go. The first day or so, he just hit him in the head with a hammer. It was it was it was weird. Just I'm telling you that I'm telling you honestly. The the more I read, I get some days I just don't even want to look at the news. The more I read the news, I, I'm honest. Before I told my wife the same thing. I said the more I read about this day and age, it seems like the more and more like the demonic oppression during the Lord's life here on earth during His earthly ministry. It seems like we're getting more and more like that. More just pure devils and devilish activity. And everybody starts talking about mental, mental, mental. I know there's people with mental problems. My, my dad had, had brain damage from World War II, and he was paranoid schizophrenic. I, I'm aware of it. I'm aware. But there's something different with some of this stuff. This is demonic. This is devilish. Uh, all of it's not just, just mental. Some of it's just wicked. And uh, I, I think we're getting, I, I do. I think that's one of the uh, estimations of we're in the last days, and I think it's getting close to during the tribulation. During the tribulation, literal hell is going to open up on earth. You're going to have the literal devils released in, in different times here on earth and that influence is going to be great during that day and age and and uh, so i think we're getting near that but all right that's all of our, our letters i thought i had another prayer letter a missionary letter to read to you but I, I couldn't find it so i must have it at the house um and we'll get right into our study tonight uh revelation chapter number eight if you would revelation chapter number eight we're going to try to finish up this pause tonight and when we come back here on sunday night we should be ready for the first trumpet to sound. We'll be ready for the uh, first trumpet judgment to sound in verse number seven. But we're uh, speaking on this second pause. We're still involved in this second pause. Remember the first pause was that space of a half an hour when the seal was opened up. The lamb opens up that seventh seal. There's silence in heaven for a space of a half an hour. Uh, then you see it looks like they're moving right into the trumpet judgments after half an hour. That's what you're thinking. You see the seven angels. They stand before God, his throne. They're given seven trumpets, and you're thinking they're about to blow. They're about to sound. Then there's a second pause. Verse 3, 4, and 5 deals with the second pause. We're going to read those verses, verse 3, 4, and 5, and get back into our study tonight. Verse number 3, Revelation chapter 8. Another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. 
And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now the picture here so that you get a proper understanding of what's going on. We've got this. We've got the seven angels standing up there before the throne of God. And before his presence, they are given each a trumpet to sound. And each one of those trumpets represents uh, a particular um, uh, trumpet judgment of God, the seven trumpet judgments of God. And at that point in time, there's a second pause. Another angel comes on the scene. He stands at the altar having a golden censer. And there's given unto him, the Bible says, much incense. We'll deal with that in just a minute. Much incense. Incense always has an accommodation with prayer, always has an association with prayer. Uh, he's given much incense, and, uh, and he's going to offer that up with the prayers of the, all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, that golden altar is representative of the altar of incense, the two altars that are pictured in the temple here on earth, and that's supposed to be a pattern of the one in heaven, is in the outer court you have the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice. That's where the sacrifices were completed on. Uh, you also have out there the drink offering, other offerings out there. And then you have the altar of incense that is in the, inside the court, inside the, the, the holy realm of the temple. Uh, it's not outside the court, but inside the court. Right before you get to the veil of the, of the temple, uh, you get past that veil and you move back into the Holy of Holies where the uh, mercy seat is at, and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so that's the picture. This is the second altar, the one close to the Holy of Holies, the altar of incense right before the veil. Right before the, in essence, it's picturing right before the presence of God. That's where this is at. And that incense is always pictured um, or had an association with the prayers of the saints. There's a second view to that, and we'll get to that again in, also in a moment. But it represents more than just the prayers of the saints. Uh, but we'll, we'll get that in just a minute. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But So that's the picture. He's given that, and he's going to offer with the prayer of the saints uh, on the golden altar. He's going to, uh, as designed by God, God gave them four different ingredients to design the incense. And they all picture have a picture of Christ. He's going to present that on the coals, the live coals on that altar. That's the altar of incense. He's going to picture that, and the smoke is going to be billowing up from that altar. Then he's also going to have those coals transform into that censer. That censer is that little golden round thing you see. Many times in, in Judaism, you'll see as they'll, they'll swing it, walking through a community sometimes. That's also representing both, both prayers and intercession. Um, and, he'll, and he'll be smoking. If you've ever noticed that or seen that video, as they're walking through an area, sometimes when an area is stricken with sickness, They'll walk through. They did that in Bible days, too. They'll walk through swinging that, and the smoke of that incense is the prayers of the saints asking God for intercession, asking God to intervene with that sickness. And that's what he's going to do. He had to carry that censer back with him, the, the high priest, behind the veil into the Holy of Holies. Because if that smoke did not cover the ark in the mercy seat, he had dropped dead. That's the only thing protected him is the smoke from that censer in front that came off the altar of incense. That's what protected him. Now, the, how the fire got to the altar of incense, those coals were transferred from the brazen altar that by instruction of God. Go back to Leviticus, you'll see that. And he took the coals, we read that on, on Sunday night, he took the coals off of the brazen altar in the censer and transferred them, live coals, into the altar of incense. And those coals are the same coals that were at the brazen altar. Who knows how the brazen altar originally was lit? How many of you remember that? It was supernatural. Fire came from heaven. God lit the brazen altar to begin with. That was God that lit that. That's the picture of the wrath of God lighting those coals, lighting those fires. And on that brazen altar is going to be the sacrifice, which is the picture of Christ being sacrificed for our sins. And once Christ, of course, is pictured sacrifice for our sins, there's no more need of any of those yearly offerings because Christ is once and for all. Hebrews explains that. But those, that fire and the fiery coals from that brazen altar is transferred to the altar of incense. And then that, that uh, altar of incense is where it, it's transferred. The same coals is transferred into that censer. And that censer is where he's going to also uh, have that incense and go back into the Holy of Holies. And that protects him. Uh, I want to make a few more comments about this second pause after this seventh seal is opened and before the first trumpet judgment is unleashed. 
Some Bible commentators have pointed out that the Lamb, Christ, is never mentioned in relation to the sounding of the seven trumpet judgments, and they're obviously correct. That is correct. Um, the seven trumpet judgments are sounded by seven angels, and Christ is not mentioned in relation to those judgments. He's not the one. At the seven seals, he's the one that opens all seven seals. You have to combine the last verse of chapter number uh, 7, verse number 17, which mentions the Lamb. You have to combine that with the pronoun he in verse number 1 of chapter number 8 to understand that it is the Lamb, that he is referencing back to the Lamb in verse uh, 17 of chapter 7. Uh, it, it is the Lamb that opens the seventh seal. The Lamb opens all seven seals. But the Lamb does not sound any of the seven trumpet judgments. He's not involved in that. Those are angels. There are also seven angels that are involved in, in pouring out the vials of the, the wrath of God's judgment uh, when we get to that point. So those are angels as well. Only with the seals is the Lamb directly related. So they are correct. The Lamb is not pictured anywhere in sounding of the seven in the sounding of the seven judgments. And, and what they were are attributing to that is that uh, this another angel cannot be the lamb because he's not connected in any way with the seven trumpet judgments. The problem with their thinking is verses 3, 4, and 5 are not under any of the seven trumpet judgments. The activities in verse 3, 4, and 5 are under the seventh seal. Not any of the judgments. The judge, the trumpet, not any of the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments haven't been sounded yet. None of them have been sounded. They're in Paul's. Remember, we're Paul's before they are sounded. The first trumpet judgment is not first sounded to verse seven. So you're not under any activity of the trumpet judgments until verse seven on. Verse three, four, and five is actually an event occurring under the seventh seal before any trumpet judgments are sounded. So it does fit under the seventh seal because the lamb is the preeminent one that is opening the events of, involved in the seven seals. No, he's not involved in the, in the sounding of the seven trumpet judgments or the pouring out of the seven vile judgments. Those are angels, but here he's clearly involved. And uh, so it fits. If that, uh, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. But uh, th that reasoning and trying to say that can't be the lamb does not hold true because this is not under any of the trumpet judgments. This is prior to the trumpet judgments being sounded. They have been presented but not yet sounded. This is still all under the seventh seal. Um, so the first trumpet judgment doesn't sound to verse number seven. And all seven seals are opened by the lamb. And if you'll notice in verse number one, the lamb is not mentioned by name, but he is identified by the pronoun he is. I've already mentioned to you. My suggestion would be that, that possibly God purposely did this. He identified him with the pronoun he so that there would be no confusion in identifying the another angel as Christ. If you mention, if you mention the lamb in verse one, and then you mention the same individual but being pictured as another angel in verse three, four, and five, it might be confusing. But he's not mentioned in verse number one as he is with all the other six seals. He's mentioned specifically, and the lamb opened, or then the lamb opened, or was opened by the lamb. But it, that, that it just says, and he opened in verse number one of chapter number eight. Does it mention the lamb by name? And I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that possibly that's so God can keep us from confusing who the another angel is in verse uh, 3 there. As he's identified, his actions are identified in verse number 3, 4, and 5. Now, I don't know that. I mean, I don't know that to be certain. It's just a suggestion. We don't know for sure who the another angel is. We don't know for sure that it's Christ. We don't know. There are very good arguments of why it isn't Christ, but there are just as many good arguments of why it very well could be Christ. We're not certain who that is. I'll tell you exactly why I think it is Christ. I'll tell you, I make no bones about it. I just have a difficult time seeing anyone else performing the duties of the high priest in heaven other than Christ who is presented as our great high priest. He's presented as our eternal great high priest in the heavens. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. So that pictures the great high priest standing in front of the throne of grace, which is exactly where the another angel is at in Revelation 8. 
It's exactly where he's pictured. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 23. The Bible said, And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So if he's in heaven and he is doing the priestly duties or, uh, you know, pertaining to the altar of incense, he's doing those priestly duties, it would be someone who is ever living. It's someone who's alive and ever living, not someone who's mortal flesh down here on earth or like the old priest would be. Um, so that gives me indication or at least... In my mind, that it very well could be Christ. We don't know for sure, but I personally believe it probably is Christ. I can't, I can't picture anyone else. I've not heard any argument better than the argument that it very well could be Christ. And I think there's several reasons looking at that, but I wouldn't argue with anybody over that. Uh, we're not, he's not identified openly. Verse 3, Revelation chapter 8. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints before the golden altar which was before the throne. There was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The, word for, the, the Greek word for given and the Greek word for offer is the same word, the exact same word. It's translated given in the first part of that sentence. It's translated offer. In the middle part of that sentence, there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Um, it, it, the word given there is, is, it has multiple meanings depending on where it's used in the scriptures, but it has the in, influence of being granted or authority to. Uh, the the uh, idea is, is given in, that, in this passage here. It was given, authority was given. Um, unto him uh, over this incense. He has possession of it that he should offer. It was given, he's given possession of it so that he should offer it. He was given the authority to receive it. He was given the authority to offer it unto God uh, with all the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And again, that seems to picture Christ because Christ is the mediator. It seems to be a ministry of mediation here that's being pictured. That's exactly in line with the, the Day of Atonement, the offer or the a picture of mediation there. Incense has always been associated with prayer. Now, we, we read this verse on, um, on Sunday night. It's the best verse I know to show us the connection to prayer for incense. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, we didn't deal really with the last part of that verse, but we, we did deal with the first part on Sunday night. But the Bible does say, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The two are connected. The prayer, being a, or incense being a type of prayer, and the lifting up of, of, of hands as the evening is appreciated, or, or great, God is grateful for these things and appreciating of these things as the evening sacrifice. He loves these things. He's pleased with these things as much as he is the evening sacrifice. The prayers of the saints are as pleasing to God as the evening sacrifice. Both are pictured here. Both prayer and praise, lifting up of hands, both prayer and praise is pleasing to God. That Really, you can sum that verse up that way. Both prayer and praise is pleasing to God. So when they offer the incense, we know God was pleased. Uh, it, when, he, when he had the, it, the odors of the incense enter into his nostrils, that's the picture in the scriptures, he was well pleased with this. He was honored by this. And uh, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Prayer pleases God. Uh, Psalm 145, verse number 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. Prayer it pleases God. Prayer has always pleased God. Prayer is a type of worship. So was the incense offering. It was a type of worship before God. God took it very seriously. When we get on our knees, it is not just to give God our checklist of everything we need him to give us. Prayer is a communication with God. It is a form of worship. And if you look, if you come into the house of God 
This is the house of worship. It is a house of prayer, yes, but it's also a house of worship. You come into the house of God in the wrong manner, the wrong thinking, the wrong attitude. You walk in here with worldliness on your mind and wickedness in your heart. You are not going to be able to worship God because God is not going to commune with you. And you know that's true. You know it is. You walk in here with bitterness at some other Christian individual. God says, leave your, all, uh, leave your gift at the altar and go get it right. And then come back and give your gift to God. You're not going to commune with God and fellowship with God to your heart's right. Okay? That's, uh, every principle in the Word of God testifies to that. You cannot come in a house of worship and worship with God if your heart is not right. Whatever worship you give is fake and God recognizes it as fake. He does the same thing with prayer. The same thing. The first thing we are to do when we get on our knees is magnify the Lord. Give God glory. Give God thanks because we're in his presence. God, you are to be glorified because thou art God. And beside thee, there is none else. We're to praise God's holy name. We're to thank him for blessing us even though we know we're not worthy of it. And then what's the next thing we do? We're to seek forgiveness for we, where we have erred. God, forgive me. I've erred in this point, in that point, in this point, in this point. You already knew that. God wants you to ask, he wants you to seek, seek to be made right before God so that you might stand in the right position before God in this life, in this life. So he wants us to go before God in prayer. And when we do that, when we follow that mode of worship in prayer, we begin with worshiping God, honoring God, praising God, thanking God, and then we say, God, now forgive me, I failed you. Humbly, God, forgive me, I've sinned. And we begin to ask God, Lord, anything maybe I'm not aware of. Maybe I, I haven't remembered it. You reveal it to me now. Then we patiently wait. God, is there anything? We are so quick in our prayer. You know we are. We're in such a rushed world. Satan has got this world going so fast nowadays. Even in our prayer time for Christians. Number one, have a hard time finding time to pray because we're so busy. And when we do, we rush it. We rush our prayer time. Well, I do. We all do. We have a tendency to rush our prayer time instead of waiting on God. God, you're, you hear me. I believe that. I've opened my heart. As far as I know, my heart's clean, pure before you. I'm not perfect, but I confess and I repent. God, you help me. I want to do right. I honor you and adore you. I worship you. Normally, in the middle of honoring and adoring him, he's going to make himself known to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. If your heart's genuine, normally, about, about middle ways through your praising God, honoring God, and thanking God for how good he's been to you, he shows up. It's different ways and different manners at different times, but God will make his presence known. You've known, you've talked to the Lord. And, and when, when that happens, then you're prepared to listen to God. Lord, is there anything else in my life that I'm not aware of that you think I need to make corrections with? I'm sure there are. Would you show me? And then pause and wait on God to show you. If you have faith that he hears you, you ought to have faith to wait on him to answer you. Right? That's the truth. But we rush through it so fast. Lord, if there's anything, show it to me. Like God's just going to knock us over the head going out the door or something. Right now is when you need to wait. He'll, he'll answer you right now if you'll wait. If you'll wait, just wait a little bit. That's in the scriptures too. All throughout the scriptures, we're encouraged to wait in prayer. Wait patiently on the Lord. Make our prayer and wait. Lord, is there anything else? And if God doesn't give you peace on anything, allows you to move on to the next point in prayer, then move on. But we get in such a hurry. We get in such a hurry. We have to be careful about that. But the Bible teaches us that God's pleased with prayer. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God is pleased in prayer. God is worshipped in prayer. God is pleased with our prayer. The smoke of the incense pictures our prayers coming before God. As smoke is sure to ascend. Have any of you ever seen smoke descend? It doesn't. Unless the wind pushes it down. Smoke doesn't descend. Smoke always ascends. Just like the sparks over the book of Job. As the sparks fly upward, so is trouble. So is trouble. You know you see a fire at nighttime, the sparks never, never go down unless there's some heavy object that it, it sparks up and then goes down because it's going out. Sparks always fly upward. Smoke always ascends. It always rises up. As sure as smoke is to ascend, God is sure to hear our prayers. That's what God's telling us. 
That smoke ascending is a picture of God hearing our prayers. The smoke of the incense pictures our prayers coming before God. In Luke chapter number 1, verse number 8, we were over here the, the, the other night, might have been Sunday night, and talking about Zacharias here when God sent Gabriel the angel to him to tell him about the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse number 8, and it came to pass that while he executed, talking about Zacharias here, while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Okay, so the normal custom for Zacharias as a priest and his duties was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. They're outside praying because it was the custom at that time of day to burn incense. And incense has an association with prayer, always. So the people were outside praying. And this is the picture. They're going, Lord God, I, we believe that you are pleased with our prayers just as you are pleased with this incense in the temple. The, this is time of incense as the smoke is rising upwards and, and pleasing you, God, in your nostrils. We pray that you would hear our prayers with that same effect to be pleased to answer our prayers. And that's why they're out there praying. The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thy prayer is heard. In verse number 9, his lot was to burn incense. In verse number 10, the people were praying because that was the custom in the time of the day when they were burning incense and they were hoping God would hear their prayers. Verse number 11, the angel Gabriel, who's later identified as Gabriel in verse number, verse number 19, uh, he appears unto Zacharias standing beside the altar of incense. And in verse 13, the angel Gabriel tells Zacharias, thy prayer is heard. So the understanding is God heard their prayers and was pleased with the offer of incense. The association are together. As the smoke of the incense rises up, just as sure as that smoke's going to rise, if you're a child of God and you appear before God in the right frame of mind, the right, right uh, attitude of heart, God hears your prayers. That's the picture. That's what God's sending forth, the message. So that's why God heard his prayer, because he was pleased with both the incense and the prayers that he heard. However, both the prayers and the incense is in vain if it comes from a rebellious or a sinful heart. Isaiah chapter number 1, verse number 4. Ah, sinful nation. God is um, allowing the prophet Isaiah to write to the, the, J Judah here, specifically Judah here. Ah, sinful nation of people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. I flip over to verse number 12. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts, bring no more vain oblations. Oblations are prayers. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. See, they were coming before God just in a ritual, just out of tradition. Like a lot of times we catch ourselves and how our prayers go. We just, because we're supposed to, we'll quickly say, Lord bless us and keep us and protect us, help us and let me win the lottery. That kind of thing. Just quickly give him a rough lit instead of communing with God, instead of our heart being pure before God and being clean in our life, oftentimes we quickly do it. And God says, here, he makes no bones about it. He said, don't, don't pray to me anymore. Bring me no more vain oblations. If you're oblations, your prayers are all going to be vain like this. Don't even pray to me. God loves prayer. He's pleased with our prayer. He's just not pleased with our hypocritical prayers. Incense is an abomination unto me. The only time God ever says that is when we're really making a mockery out of these things. And that's what they were doing. That's what Judah was doing. They were making a mockery because they weren't genuine in their heart. They didn't mean it in their heart and their soul. They had one foot out in the Canaan, out in pagan land and one foot in the temple. As many Christians do today, one foot in the world, one foot in the church. And they were displeasing God. Their lives were vain before God because they weren't real. They weren't, they weren't genuine. They weren't honoring God with life. They had sin kept in their heart rebellious towards God, and yet they had a wish list. Before They would constantly come before God with their wish list. 
And they thought God was going to hear them because they were Jews. Didn't have it to the, in their mind, it didn't matter whether they lived ungodly or not. Most of them were living ungodly. That's why God let them get conquered by the Babylonians. In their mind, everything was okay because they're Jews. They're special. I'm telling you, you listen to me now. There are people I've talked to them, and they think that, that because they pray and they profess to be a Christian, God has an obligation to hear them. If you regard iniquity in your heart, God is going to treat that prayer as vain, just like he did with Israel. So God is pleased with our prayers as he's pleased with that odors of the incense in his nostrils. He's pleased with it if we come with a, con with a humble heart and a contrite spirit. And not that we're perfect, but that we have a desire to have a relationship with God, a right relationship in holiness. But when we make a hip, become a hypocrite with it, we're hypocritical over it, and we make the act of, of prayer hypocrisy by coming before God with sin, regarding sin in our life, knowing we're not right with God, and just going through the tradition, God's not pleased with that. He calls it vain oblations. He calls that incense an abomination. It's pretty serious to God. Um, so in Revelation chapter 8, the incense not only pictures the prayer of the saints, but it also pictures intercession for the saints. So it does picture the prayer of the saints as association with prayer of the saints, but it is also picturing intercession on the behalf of the saints. Now remember, what is God getting ready to do? What is God, in, he's already set them up, given them the trumpets, they're about to sound. So what is God getting ready to do to the earth? What's getting ready to happen? He's getting ready to unleash his trumpet judgments of wrath here on earth. There are saints suffering down here on earth at the hand of the Antichrist. And they're gonna, that suffering is going to increase greatly. God's picturing throughout the whole great tribulation. He's getting ready to unleash the great tribulation, open up the great tribulation. That's about to happen. That will actually, I, I do believe that that happens at the seventh seal, but it's more specifically with the first trumpet. That really opens up that area of the great tribulation as far as the wrath of God is concerned. Great tribulation is about to be poured out upon this earth with that first trumpet. Great tribulation. And uh, so we got to keep that in mind. So not only is the, the incense picturing the prayer of the saints, but it's also picturing intercession for those saints because there are saints on this earth at the time that God's great tribulation is going to be unleashed upon this earth. Look at Numbers. Let me show you an example of this. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16 and verse number 41. Now, in this passage, God sends a plague because of Israel's murmuring against Moses and Aaron. They've been murmuring against Moses and Aaron, and God's tired of it. And he's going to send a plague upon them. Numbers chapter 16, verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation. And behold, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord appeared. God showed up. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh, jump down to verse number 46. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took his Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now, that incense does represent the prayer of the saints, association, but it also represents intercession. That's exactly what it represents here, what it pictures here. The smoke of that incense pictures intercession on the behalf of the people where the plague was starting to kill them. The plague was on them. And as soon as God, the, the smoke of this incense, entered into the nostrils of God, the plague was stayed. The intercession. That's the exact picture you have in Revelation chapter 8. It's a picture of atonement. That's exactly what you've got there. You've got the same situation, a golden censer with the with the. Uh, incense of God within it, the coals of God's fiery wrath, and then the incense on top of that, and then you see it, the smoke billowing up. So yes, it represents the prayer of the saints, but it also represents God's intercession. He's going to take that censer. What's he going to do with it? He's going to cast it into the earth. 
So who's he interceding for on the earth? The saints that are suffering down there. He's picturing intercession, not just prayer. He's picturing intercession. There are a lot of preachers miss this in Revelation chapter 8. He's picturing intercession for those saints. That's part of the picture there. So, so the smoke of the incense pictured an atoning intercession in the book of Numbers. The same is true in Revelation 8 prior to God sounding the seven trumpet judgments. The same is true. God's picturing intercession on their behalf. Now, God can intercede anyhow he wants. God can intercede by sparing them of the, like he did in Numbers with, with the plate. And God can intercede with grace. We see that in the New Testament. God did not deliver Paul from the affliction in his body. He did not deliver him from that thorn in the flesh. But what God interceded on his behalf. How did God intercede? He gave him what? Grace. He gave him grace. And that's what God's going to do on this earth. He's going to unleash his horrible wrath. And if it wasn't for God's intercession, interceding power, the saints are going to think, God hates us. The saints are going to think, I, I, evidently we got it wrong. We're all going to burn in hell. Look at this judgment. But God's going to give an intercession to them so that they understand to some degree that this is God's wrath being poured out upon the world, but God loves you. Somehow, some way, God's going to make it known to them. His grace is going to be sufficient. It's never failed the first Christian yet. Why do we think it would fail those believers during the tribulation? God's grace will be sufficient. I can't look. I can't explain all that. I can't tell you how someone can lose every member of their family. I can't tell you how they can lose every member of their family. And we've had Christians that's, that's happened. We've had Christians that have written songs in their songbook that lost just about every member of their family, devastated. Then God let them sit down at a piano or sit down and write down a beautiful hymn. Holy Ghost just moves on their heart. How could they do that, Grace? God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. So we need to understand that. That's the picture of Revelation 8. It does picture prayer of the saints, but it also pictures intercession. It's a picture of intercession there. Now, we, back to Revelation 8, the incense there, we have a couple of notes here. The Bible didn't just say there was given unto him incense, but much incense. It uses the word much. Given him much incense. You have to understand, much intercession is needed because the great tribulation is coming. They're, he's given much incense because the saints are going to need much intercession. They're, they're going to be wore out by the Antichrist. He's going to make war with those saints, and he's going to wear them out, the Bible says. They're going to need much intercession, so he's given much incense. Then it says prayer of all saints. It uses that phrase, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Now, it does not make sense. To include church saints in this. The church saints have already been raptured out. They're already in heaven. They're not on the earth. So it doesn't make any sense there. It doesn't make any sense to represent the Old Testament saints. They're, they're already raptured out. So this is talking about all the saints of the tribulation. All the saints of the tribulation. It is those saints that have been crying out to God since the fifth seal. If you remember that. The fifth seal, they're crying out to God. How long, oh God? How long before you take vengeance on us upon those that... Killeth us. God, how long? And God's beginning to show them that he hadn't forgotten. He's going to answer. He tells them in, in that fifth seal, he says, you got to wait to the rest of those that have got to go through the same thing you went through, have been completed. They're going through that. But, but God actually starts here. The picture is God beginning that work here in chapter number eight as he's beginning. He, he doesn't just let Satan unleash Satan's wrath upon the world, but God's going to unleash his wrath upon Satan and the wicked doers of unrighteousness upon this world. Um, and so we, we, we see that. It, so this is the tribulation saints, all tribulation saints. These prayers are coming from the fellow servants and the brethren from Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. And they, in verse, Revelation 6, 10 and 11, the fifth seal, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. This is a picture of their fellow servants and their brethren. This is the picture over there, the prayers of the saints. Uh, those that are there in the fifth seal, those are already in heaven. They did pray that prayer, no doubt. Um, but they're, and they're crying for vengeance here, but they're already, once they're in heaven, their they're suffering's over with. Those in, in the Revelation chapter 6, the suffering's over with because they're already in heaven. This is the fellow servants and the brethren that are going to be the prayers that are included in verse number 3. The prayers of all saints. 
All right, verse 5, and I'm done. The angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. As sure as the prayers of God's saints go up, the fire of God's wrath is coming down. Just as sure. I promise you, just as sure. The book of Hosea, chapter number 8, verse number 14. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send fire, a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. In the book of Amos. Amos chapter 1, verse number 4. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Uh, verse number 7. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the places thereof. Verse number 9. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, uh, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. Verse number 12. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Verse number 14. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof, with shouting in the day of battle, with the tempest in the day of the whirlwind. This is picturing the fiery judgment of God when it falls upon this world, when it falls upon earth. As sure as the prayers of God's saints go up, the fire of God's wrath is coming down. I promise you it's going to happen. And people will be just as shocked. The, the first time a Christian reads this, believe in the Bible, first time a Christian is saved and the presence of God so real in their life, they read this in the scripture, it's shocking to them. Wow. Am I thankful God saved me? But they immediately they say, i got to have a burden my loved ones. They're going to go through this. It's so real to you. That's how real it's going to be to these folks in that day when they see it happen. Just as real as those folks that didn't get on board Noah's Ark, about the time the flood started, about the time the rain started coming down, and all of a sudden the water started rising, and they realized he preached truth. It's too late. It's too late to those that are eternally damned. And it would be too late during the tribulation for those that have already taken the mark of the beast. It's too late. They're, they're condemned. They're doomed. The golden censer is filled with fiery coals from under the brazen altar. The altar of sacrifice is cast then into the earth. And those coals represent the fire of God's wrath. Remember now that the coals at that brazen altar represent both salvation and damnation. Okay? You need to understand that. The, coal, the, fiery, coal, the fiery coals underneath that altar... Because of the sacrifice being on the altar represents salvation. God's wrath is unleashed on the sacrifice. Christ is our sacrifice. If you're saved by the grace of God, it represents salvation. The same coals that represent salvation, lost sinners that reject the sacrifice of God will be cast into those coals in the lake of fire for all eternity. That's damnation. So the same altar pictures salvation and pictures damnation. The result of this happening is going to cause the earth to go into convulsions. And that's what we read over there in, in verse number 6, or rather verse number seven, uh, 5. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. It's going to go into convulsions. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. These same, same strange events will occur three times in the book of Revelation. It occurs here in the seventh seal. It occurs in Revelation eleven nineteen in the seventh trumpet. 11.19, the Bible says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. There were seen in, in, the, in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. Adds great hell there. But it's seen there. And then it's seen in the seventh vial in Revelation chapter 16, verse number 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Three times in the book of Revelation you see the same type of event. Some changes but the same type of event in dealing with the three different segments of God's judgments. The seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial. That cannot be just a coincidence. There's a summary God's given. At the seventh seal, God gives a summary. This is going to bring convulsions upon the earth. The seventh trumpet, God gives a summary. This is going to bring convulsions upon the earth. The seventh vial, God gives a summary. This is going to bring further convulsions upon the earth. And this is clearly a supernatural event each time it happens. And according to the scripture, this supernatural event comes from the throne of God itself. Revelation chapter 4, verse number 4. And round about the throne, 
were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed and in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is where, this is the first reference in Revelation, by the way. And God says it comes from the throne. And then you see it three times, from the throne to the earth. Three times. It comes from the throne. It comes from God. God prophesied that for his enemies in Psalm 97. Psalm 97, verse number 1. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of, of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. And you, you see in Psalm 97, you see a picture of how things are going to take place. The fire goes from the throne, goes before him, and burneth up his enemies round about in verse number 3. The fire of God's wrath goes before him. Then in verse number 5, then the Lord makes his literal presence known. First, he pours out his wrath. Then later, he makes his literal presence known. That is exactly the picture of the tribulation and at the end of the tribulation of the Lord's second coming. That's exactly what he does. That's exactly what he does. And then we'll just close the lesson tonight, verse number 6 of Revelation chapter 8. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now it's ready to begin the great tribulation. No more pauses. No more delays, no more interceding mercies. God's unbridled fury is now going to be vented out upon this world. And that's what's going to happen as soon as that first trumpet blows. And it's going to be, and you, you see, a, ten, you see a, a picture throughout the scriptures, just like it was the seals. Remember the four, boom, 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 boom. And then the next three followed slowly thereafter in the seals. Same thing happens with the trumpets and the vows. First four trumpets, boom, 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 boom. And then the next three trumpets. And each one of the last three trumpets holds one of the woes. There are three woes that has to be presented. Each one of the last trumpets has a woe. And then you see the same thing, seven vials. First vial is boom, 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 boom. And then the last three, slower, comes in. It's just a, the way God's got it in the scriptures. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep hitting this world. And yet, after all of this, Wicked man, we would think, you know, we keep having this, we keep saying it. We keep telling people, boy, if we could just somehow, if God just just hang these sinners out of hell on rotten thread, let them see, or just drop them in hell for five seconds, they'd all get saved. No, they won't. They're going to live in hell on earth. And yet still, men are going to shake their, face, their, their fists in the face of God and blaspheme his name during tribulation. I can't explain that. But people, when their heart is black and they refuse to let God move in their heart, soften their heart, they will die and go to hell as a bitter, lost soul. Many are already down there. Father, thank you, Lord, for the study tonight. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to realize every word in your Bible is true. And every prophecy, God, that you've given the word of God is true and will take place just exactly as you've said it has. I pray that you'd help us to be aware of that, God. Then, Lord, burden our hearts, God, for lost souls, for lost loved ones, for lost neighbors and family and friends and acquaintances. Give us compassion for the lost, God. Please give us compassion for them. Give us a passion for the gospel, for righteousness, for prayer, God. Lord, help us, God, to try to reach them with the gospel while we still can. Help us, God, to work out in that vineyard, Lord, till the last second, God, when you return. Help us, God, to labor, Lord, we pray. Now, bless the prayer time, we ask. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you've got your prayer list, if you'll pull it out quickly. I've already mentioned many prayers tonight, and, uh, and, and I saw you.